Hey everybody, tonight's video is called a demoralizing attack on faith and tonight we continue our pass through study here in the book of Isaiah where we're going to be looking at this guy named Sennacherib attempt to capture Jerusalem. And so these next four chapters through chapter, what is it, 39, basically we're going to see Isaiah quote or pretty much, you know, almost say word for word what you can find in 2 Kings 18, chapters 18 through 20. And Isaiah, he adds it to make the references to Assyria all the more understandable. And Isaiah is the author of this section as 2 Chronicles 32, 32 says, Isaiah also wrote the Acts of Hezekiah. In Isaiah's record was incorporated into two kings by the writer of 2 Kings. And so chapters 36 through 39 from the transition close in the first division of Isaiah's prophecy. In chapters 36 and 37, today's and tomorrow's video, are the historic consumption of the first 35 chapters of Jerusalem's deliverance from Assyria. And then in chapter 38 on Saturday, and early next week, chapter 39, they're the historical basis for the rest of the book of Isaiah. And so it's a preview of the Babylonian captivity from that point. And uh, so we'll start right here. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing four chapters in Isaiah this week, Lord willing. Uh, today and tomorrow and Saturday. So Isaiah 36, starting verse 1 through 3, it says, Now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then the king of Assyria sent the Rabak, Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood at the Akudak from the upper pool on the highway to the Fuller's Field. And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to him. So we see Sennacherib's attack came in 701 B.C. And Hezekiah's reign began in 715 B.C. as co-regent with Ahaz until he reigned in 715 uh, he was co-regent with Ahaz in 729 B.C. In 2 Kings 18, verse 1, Sennacherib was king of Assyria. So, Sennacherib was king between 705 to 681 B.C. And the fortified cities was the discovery of the ancient annals of Sennacherib reveals the cities that he conquered in his campaign southward of Sidon, on the Mediterranean coast. And in verse 2, Rabshakeh was the spokesperson for Sennacherib. So when you see the name Rabshakeh oftentimes throughout the chapter, think of him as kind of like the uh, how the president has someone that handles his social media affairs. He's pretty much a secretary, if you want to think of it that way. So Rabshakeh was a spokesperson of for Sennacherib's three highest officials who represented the king against Jerusalem on this occasion, according to 2 Kings 18, verse 17. And I challenge you, you know, if you want to read 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings 18, 19, and 20. And the great army was a token force of the main army with which Sennacherib hoped to bluff Judah and to submit in, as we'll see in our next chapter, verse 36. And Lachish was approximately 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And Sennacherib's conquest of the city was in its closing place when he sent the messengers. And Isaiah, he met Ahaz at the same spot to try to unsuccessfully to dissuade him from trusting in foreign powers in Isaiah chapter 7, verse three and in so verse three we see the word recorder 
and recorder was the position that was intermediary between the king and the people. And verse 4 through 6 here says, Then the Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence in this in which you trust? I say you speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if, um, if, if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pairs it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. So the great king of Assyria was the self-appointed title of Assyrian kings. They held themselves in high regards. And in contrast, Rabshakeh rudely omitted any title for Hezekiah. And in verse 5, words amounted to nothing when it came to warfare. And in other words, Judah was defenseless. And the challenge to choose between loyalty to Assyria, other political powers, or to the Lord is the essential message of Isaiah. And in verse 6, we see that the Assyrians' advice strongly resembled that of Isaiah that we saw back in Isaiah chapters 19, verse 14 through 16, Isaiah 30, verse 7, and Isaiah 31, verse 3. And we, we see that Hezekiah had depended on support for, uh, for support on Egypt until now. And as we see here in verse 6, trusting in Egypt is like trusting one weight to a broken reed, which can provide no support even to its whole. And the Lord wanted Judah to trust in him and instead of trusting in Egypt. And Rabshakeh spoke truth, but his intent wasn't to bring Judah to firm trust in the Lord, but to demoralize Judah and drive them to despair. And Satan, we should know Satan, we can think of Satan just like the Rabshakeh. He attacks us in the same way. And isn't it strange that Rabshakeh could see the truth of Egypt's weakness better than many of the leaders of Judah could? In verse 7 it says, But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he who whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar. So Rabshakeh mistakenly thought that Hezekiah's reforms in removing the idols back in 2 Kings 18 verse 4 and 2 Chronicles 31 verse 1 had removed opportunities to worship the Lord. And it was utterly foreign to polytheistic Assyrians that all worship should center in Solomon's temple. And in Rabshakeh's thinking, Hezekiah's reforms have really displeased God, so he shouldn't expect help from the Lord God of Israel. In verse 8 and 9 says, Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to the, my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able to, on your part to put riders on them. How then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? So verses 8 and 9, Rabshakeh, we see he is taunting and minimized Judah's best defensive efforts even with Egypt's help. And Judah didn't have a cavalry. And Rabshakeh's strategy was to make Judah give up. And as I mentioned with Rabshakeh, we can think of him as like Satan. Because Satan, his goal, he doesn't want to go to blows with you. He doesn't want to go to blows with you. He wants you to give up. He operates the same way. Satan is not itching for a fight with you. He wants to talk you into giving up all. And Rabshakeh's basic message was, we could beat you one hand tied behind our backs. That's literally what he is saying. 
In verse 10, have I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. So Rabshakeh's boastful claim of the authority of Judah's God for his mission may have been a ploy on his part to get a surrender, but it aligned with Isaiah's prophecy that the Assyrians would be the his instrument to punish the people, as we see back early on in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 7 and 8, and Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. And the Assyrians may have heard this from the partisans, or may not have known, but Judah did. And one thing we should know about God as we study the scriptures is that God is indeed, the Lord is indeed sovereign over his coming. And God did not have to tempt an innocent man with an evil plan for his will to come to pass. Man is totally depraved. And God simply allowed the Assyrians to attack Assyria, Israel, and Judah to carry out the corrupt desires of their evil hearts. In verse 11 and 12, it says, Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak to us in Hebrew and the heron of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said, Has my master sent me to your master and to you speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall? who will eat and drink their own waste with you? So Hezekiah's representatives, they are aware of the alarm created by the suggestion that the Lord was on the Assyrian side. And he, they asked Rabshakeh to change from Hebrew to Aramaic, the language of diplomacy, so that the people on the wall could understand his words and be ter terrified. And in verse 12, we see the foreign ambassador continued his efforts to damage the city's morale by speaking of the horrors of famine that a long siege would entail. And yes, Rabshakeh really said these words, who will eat and drink their own waste with you. I know it's some translations we use dung and pee and all that. Sometimes, you know, the Bible, you're just like, what? So Rabshakeh, he wants to spread fear and discouragement and despair. That is essentially what we're getting to in verses 11 and 12. And uh, we're going to read a big chunk of verses here now, verse 13 to, through 20. It says, Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and said, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria, thus says the Lord, or thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. The city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by the present, and come out to me. And every one of you eat of, from his own vine, and every one from his own fig tree, and every one of you drink the waters of his own cistern. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying that the Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sheph Arvame? Indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their countries from my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? So Rabshakeh spoke longer and louder, suggesting that Hezekiah couldn't save the city, but the great king, the king of Assyria, would fill the people with abundance. And in verse 15, we see trust and deliver. It testifies of Hezekiah's public expression of faith in God. 
And trust in the Lord is the main theme of Isaiah chapters 7 through 35. In verse 16, the Rabshakeh appeals for renewal of a political covenant with Assyria. And he tempts them with food and drink in the midst of a harsh siege. And the Assyrians project a proverbial ideal and happy life. But the Lord alone can fulfill that promise. And the official invited the people to surrender under a covenant with Assyria. And in verse 17, Rabshakeh didn't hide Assyria's well-known practice of deport and conquered peoples to distant places. And Rabshakeh would probably be hated by the Democratic Party today. In verse 18 through 20, we see Rabshakeh's eyes. The Lord was one of the many gods worshipped by nations conquered by the Assyrians. And so he was about to find out that Judah's God is quite unlike the gods of the nations that were little g gods. And Rabshakeh's speech was intended to make God's people doubt their leaders and have fear and have unbelief. And quitting and surrendering was pushed as an attractive option. And the enemy works the same way. Satan works the same way. Satan's going to work the same way on making you want to surrender and quit when hard times come. He's going to make it attractive. In verse 21, 22, to finish the chapter here, it says, But they held their peace. And answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. So Hezekiah had apparently anticipated the ultimatum of the Assyrians and had told his representatives and the men on the wall not to respond. And in verse 22, the king representatives reported to him in a state of grief and shock at the blasphemy that they thought they had heard. And may we learn from Hezekiah that it is much better to keep silent and trust God instead of trying to win an argument. And though they were silent, they were still deeply affected by this attack. And it didn't just roll off their backs as if it were nothing. Things were hard, but the battle was not lost yet. And so to wrap up tonight's video, we look at Reb Sheka. He spoke to the leaders in Hezekiah's government. And we see the officials in King Hezekiah's government met Reb Sheka, who was the general of the Assyrian army. In verse 4, Sitsa spoke against Judah's trust in an alliance with Egypt. In verse 7, Rabshakeh spoke against Judah's trust in God. And the enemy has an amazing way of discouraging our, disobedient, or, or discouraging our obedience like Rabshakeh. In verse 8 and 9, Rabshakeh spoke against the army of Judah. And as I mentioned, the enemy, he fights us into giving up. He doesn't fight you one-on-one. He did it to Jesus. He attempted, he, he, he tempted Jesus through the strategy during the temptation in the wilderness. And I want to go over to Luke chapter 4, verse 5. Luke 4, verse 5 through 8. It says, Then the devil, taking him on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory. And for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. 
So when Satan promised Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in exchange for worship from Jesus, Satan was trying to avoid the fight, and he was trying to talk Jesus into giving up. And it did not work with Jesus, and it should not work with us as well. When we feel like giving up, we should look at the temptation in the wilderness. What did Jesus do? He stood on scripture and spoke to Satan. In verse 10, it shows us that Rabshakeh tells them that the Lord God of Israel is on his side. And verse 11 and 12 showed us that Rabshakeh spoke directly to the people of Jerusalem as Hezekiah's men asked Rabshakeh to speak only to them. And then in verses 13 through 20, shows that Rabshakeh's speech to the people of Jerusalem. And we see that the chapter ends with the response of the leaders in Hezekiah's government and the citizens of Jerusalem. So let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. It says, We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed and not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body of the dying, the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. So they had the same experience that we see the Apostle Paul speaks about in 2 Corinthians 4 verses 8 and 9. Things were hard, but the battle was not lost yet. And I hope today's video is an encouragement to somebody out there. Maybe you're going through trials. Maybe you're going through some kind of storms. Whatever the situation is. The battle might be hard, but the battle's not over yet. And if you feel like physically hurting yourself, the battle's not over yet. Don't end the battle. Fight through it. And that's going to wrap up our video today. We'll be looking next at looking at God glorified and Assyria destroyed. So... That will be tomorrow's video. I hope that you have a great rest of your evening. God bless.